Good morning, everybody. Um, so myself and Connor are going to talk about HPM. So I think a lot of you guys have heard us already, so apologies for any repetition. But uh, so what I'm going to try and do is get to it very quickly. Um, just first uh, an example of, this is something we've been working on probably for about seven years, I think. So this is Henrietta Street. On your right, you have the scan, and on your left, you have the bin model. So this is a typical scan to bin for historic buildings. Um, so I just want to talk about the problems in terms of scan to bin. But first, like what you know, what what are we trying to do? So this is one of the recent projects we've been working on, Four Courts, Dublin, and uh, you know, sort of the laser scan into a bin model, and then <coughs> the sort of products that people are looking for is the usual documentation, sometimes schedules, analysis, etc. So, um, but first, I'll just uh, you know, we'll talk about the, you know, the two main problems that we face. One is the creation of a library, um, because historic buildings, the, you know, your usual uh, BIM software doesn't uh, contain, say, historic um, objects, library objects, etc. So these have to be built. And then the second thing is, how do you scan? How do you plot these objects onto laser scan and image data? Or yeah, so I mean that's it there. So this is basically uh, you know how the library is built and how you can plot it. And then we'll talk a little bit about conservation analysis. And then Connor will get into um, you know the type of work he did. So actually, let this go. Okay, so it sort of starts with um, the uh, historic documents. Um, so if, you know, we, we went back and had a look at, whoops. So this is the first, uh, first bit of uh, sort of investigation or research we did. So we're, 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 we're talking mainly about classical buildings, but you can actually trace the rules um, right back to the Vitruvius. So you're talking about, you know, between maybe 100 years before Christ. And then uh, his books on architectural were revived during the uh, Renaissance. So you have a whole series of architectural uh, pattern books or books on architecture. More or less, um, the, the, these, these are more or less stating the rules that the Greeks and Romans used for their classical buildings. And now this is the start, but the, you know, by the time these, uh, uh, you know, these styles got to Ireland, it was probably the early 1700s, late 1600s. So we have what are called pattern books. And again, this is the sort of source of information where we started, first started building our objects from. Um, so you'll see. So, um, you know, if, if you look at it from, we started looking at it from, a, say, computers, computer point of view, programmer's point of view, and sorry about this. I'll get used to this. No, it's really just a video. Yeah. Just a video. Yeah, sorry about this. Okay, my apologies. <laughs> so, and um, we'll just stop it there. So, um, you know, so moving on from the, if, if you look at the uh, pattern books, etc., you'll see that the pattern books are based on a series of, say, primitive, primitive shapes that um, make up the actual objects. So, as and such. Um, now, that's a very simple one, that's the Doric column. So, we, we were looking at, you know, how we could build these primitives how they're arranged according to the architectural rules to make up the full object. So that, because you, know, you don't always get the actual uh, arrangement of these primitives uh, 
in the building. There can be variations on they don't always stick to the rules. So you you know you need to trace it right back to the actual uh, primitive shapes and have them available. So this is just an example. So we, we use that ARCHICAD um, because it will, you know, the scripting language in, that's available, GDL, um, made it very easy for us to actually build these shapes from, um, from first principles. So you know, from the very simple ones I looked at there to the more complex uh, organic shapes. So you can see we're trying to build the Corinthian leaves here. So you know, we use the same approach, but um, in this case, you don't have stacking of sort of more simple geometric objects. And then on to, uh, you know, the standard objects, library objects that you'll find inside, in, in a classical building. So, you know, an array of, of windows, etc. You can see, you know, you start with basic shapes, you can build them up, add them together, make them more complex, etc. So again, door cases. So these are just some of the samples of the libraries that we built. And of course, they're all parametric. Um, so I just let that go again. Uh, each, each, all of these shapes are parametric, meaning that they can be formed, changed into whatever. You know, one window could represent maybe a hundred, five hundred types of windows, um, and that's you know that that sort of traces back to the, the basic script. So this one here is probably it's probably a good example here. This is uh, just roof coverings, and you know you have the sort of code there which will give you all of these shapes. These shapes can be all added together, and as you move it along, then you can get much more complex shapes. So you, you see, you start here with a simple shape. Add to it, add to it, etc. And it's all put together in whatever the arrangement is, especially for classical architecture. And here's the, the total, um, you know, the facade of the building. The next thing I'm just looking at is the problem of how, how to get these objects onto a scan. So this is, you know, dealing with, say, objects onto uh, image base, photogrammetry in this case. So you can see, the, you know, the, the objects need to be aligned onto the 3D or the 2D map, and then you have your BIM model as such. Now in these cases, it's all texture and geometry that we're capturing. And of course, they're all different parametric objects. The windows is probably, again, the best example where you can take one window and have it suit a lot of different <laughs> cases. So, and just, um, just by the way, we, this, this is a sort of wider research project. It's not only the uh, you know, PhD students we have, we have our undergrads working away on these models. This is just sort of typical students' work using lower cost software. And not, you know, without laser scanners, we're using token stations, etc., to, to capture the data. And um, photogrammetry, again, doesn't always have to be uh, laser scanning. So, uh, you know, you have recap now from Autodesk. So, this is a 3D model of the Campanile in Trinity College. It's again, very sophisticated models. And these models, you know, you don't need to break them into the parts. You can use the whole model as a mesh and lift it into uh, your bin model. So we'll just get to the case study, that, and Connor's going to go into this, this in great detail. So this is the most recent project we've been working on. So again, we're working off the historic documents. Here's our scan. So we actually scanned the whole building, but we're not looking for uh, that. So a fairly primitive BIM model is built, um, and also uh, this is something about. Uh, I'll stop this here because. So it's not always the case that you need expensive, uh, you know, 3D software. This is uh, a, a, a SketchUp model which we just cleaned up, so you know SketchUp is free, and um, it's not bad. We 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 scaled it and. So I had a look at the textures and all the rest of it. So, um, you know, it you know, there, there can be a workflow which will involve some of the uh, low cost or no cost software, open source software. And of course, as you know, uh, now uh, this is the, the, the part of the building which we concentrate on, the, the dome and the drum of the building, which is in serious problems. There is uh, damage here, and we'll have a look at it later, to the capitals and to the beams where from uh, the Civil War in 1920, where it came under artillery fire and 
the, uh, the capitals now are sinking down. So we're just having a look here. Here's a typical workflow. Create the model. So you can see, now we separated the two models. And Connor's going to talk about working straight off the scan, trying to get the uh, accuracy from the laser scan as mesh objects uh, straight into BIM. Uh, so in parallel to that, we built uh, the, uh, the 3D model or the BIM model from historic documents and from some survey data. So you can see here is just your typical workflow, how it's all put together. These are the objects being put in place. Here's the data here, plans, elevation sections. Now the problem here is that everything is straight. If the columns are tipping over, you don't represent that when you build it this way. So, and we'll talk about how you can overcome all that later. But what you do get, Um, so, see so, so you know what you get there is, is how the whole uh, building is constructed in 3D, and that's sort of getting into the next stage where we can start analysing, um, you know, the problems with the building, and then we'll go and start building the objects from scan. So you can see here, this is just some of the objects and how they're put together with some information coming from the scans. This is cuts from the, uh, from the scan of the trusses, plan of the scan. So we want you to find out where and how the trusses were aligned over the plaster uh, ceiling so that, uh, let's see how it's supported, etc. Now, as I say, this model, um, that, that, that model, everything is, in a straight line. And uh, you know, if there's any deformations in the walls, if the capitals have been damaged, you know, it's not going to be picked up that way. So, you know, how do we do that? And this is the, you know, this is where the research project um, at, at where Connor comes in. But just to say that this is a collaborative project with Trinity College, you can see um, you know, Connor there with some of the uh, researchers. So uh, Trinity College are going to work off our models where they're building um, the missing leaves, missing parts of the columns, and they will be consolidated. The stone is um, is attached, as opposed to the you know taking out the whole capitals and recarving them. So a lot of it is just consolidation, and um, because it's so far up, and they're able to you know get replicate the material, etc. So, um, so this next stage, so I'll just talk a little bit about just go back over. Okay, well, this is happening. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, this video is a big bit on the big side. I'm trying to do a voiceover. <laughs> so, uh, just take a few minutes. Um, so, we'll go back to the slides again. Yeah, so, I mean, what you've seen there is just the, the sort of basic concept be between, behind what we're doing. Um, you know, one is to build a library and try and build those library objects as uh, accurate as possible. So that's why you know, a lot of the research is based on the pattern books. Um, and then the next stage is to use the actual... Um, that's nice. Do I go into procedural mode? Um, are we running out of time? Okay, so just to recap on that, you know, here's the... You know, the first thing we do is try and represent as best we can historic objects. And um, next thing is the how we can plot. Now, different ways of plotting. Connor's going to talk a lot about that. You can actually just turn the scan data back into numbers and then place your objects from those numbers. And of course, if they're um, we not aligned on any of the axes, you can tip them in whatever direction. Um, and you can see here, you know, this is the sort of how the the object will build up a typical facade. 
starting with just the block and on to all the objects put in place. Now just very quickly, uh, what sort of data? So this is what people are looking for. Um, okay, this is just a set of planning application documents which are taken off from the scans from uh, uh, either from the 3D model or directly from uh, the scan data. Uh, and again, this is, this is the model built from the historic data. Um, I'm just getting down to the problem. So here we have um, front elevation of the capital, and that's taken, again, that's an ortho from the, the, the scan data. And this is the replication for the uh, K mapping. Okay. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about how the heat stream process is being further developed. Um, so at the moment, um, the current, some of the current problems with BIM, for standard BIM, is that BIM has very limited tools for, for uh, modeling deformation. There's very li limited library objects, first of all, and that's the main motivation for the new heat stream library. But there's also other problems like how to model irregular objects. Um, and because of this, um, the current workflows for scan to BIM are very time consuming and very costly. And there's a definite demand for increased automation and also a better tools for modeling um, deformation for scan to BIM. So one possible solution in this area is um, an approach called procedural modeling. And procedural modeling um, is an automated approach to generating 3D geometries. And it's typically been used for applications like film and gaming, where very large scenes can be randomly generated. But this approach has also actually been applied to, um, to existing cities and environments as can be seen in this, these two examples here in Brazil and also of another project in Rome, where large 3D city models have been automatically generated from rules and algorithms. And trying to model such cities like this manually just simply wouldn't be feasible. Um, so this video is just showing um, the ideas behind procedural modeling. So you can see here by changing rules, by changing parameters, the entire building model is instantly updated. And this is a very similar co concept to uh, parametric modeling in BIM. But unlike parametric modeling in BIM, here not just objects are parametric, but complete buildings and even cities can be parametric. So the advantage of procedural modeling really is automation and high um, levels of variation within the models. So it's a computer programming appro approach where, where um, the geometry is, is rules are first created with scripting languages and then they're used to model um, many, many variations. So these concepts are also now being um, developed in DIT, they're being developed for BIM and for HBIM. And the idea, again, is to try and speed up the workflows for modeling existing buildings. Um, so the aim here is to um, enable more accurate, more automated, and easier generation of BIM geometry from point clouds. So a number of um, prototypes at the moment have been developed for the Archicad BIM software. And new procedural modeling rules and algorithms are being um, um, implemented using the geometric description language, a language within Archicad, and also C++ programming languages. So this is just showing some of the concepts of it. So these procedural rules can be applied to any building shapes um, by using existing 2D uh, floor plans. And procedural rules can automatically generate your um, BIM wall components. And then you can apply more um, parameters to apply more rules, such as splitting a building facade into any number of tiles with openings, um, as you can see there. So you can just specify which building facade you want, how many um, splits you want, and the geometry will automatically be generated. And you can apply different splits to different floors, to so different numbers of objects in each floor. Um, and you can also change other parameters, like the numbers of stories. So the idea is that the, the arrangements for the building will automatically be generated and then manually refined. So all of the geometry that's generated, you can click on hotspots and interactively uh, move the, uh, move the uh, geometry to, to fit it to serving data. And the idea here as well is that um, because all the model is procedurally generated, um, by changing one part of the model, all connected elements um, are also automatically updated. So I'm just going to show these concepts now applied to a real project, in this case a restoration project of the four courts here in Dublin. Um, so what was very important for this project was the accuracy, um, so that the final BIM model could be used for documentation, so it could be used for structural analysis. And modeling um, the drum walls and a dome here um, with BIM software is quite difficult because there's very limited tools. For example, the drum wall is not perfectly vertical and it's leaning in certain places, there's warping, there's deformation. And trying to model a circular wall that's not vertical in BIM software is very difficult. So because of this, um, a new procedural uh, rule has been developed to automatically generate irregular walls and cut sections. 
So the idea is that you take cut sections through the point cloud and you'll use these cut sections to generate an irregular 3D surface. So you can just see here um, some of the cut sections brought into the r 2 BIM software. And uh, first of all, these cut sections are converted to, poly <coughs> to polygons. So you'd have polygons containing various arcs. And then um, th these various 2D cut sections um, using procedural, a proce new procedural rule, they automatically be converted to, a, to a, a, a wall component. And as you can see here, by looking at the generated wall in plan, you can straight away see areas where the wall is leaning, where the wall isn't vertical. So instead of just a generic object of a vertical wall, instead it's representing the true condition of the wall. And next you can apply um, more procedural rules to automatically generate um, other, other types of geometry. Like in this case, we'll um, split this wall, you can split it into any number of floors, or you can split it into any number of tiles. So for this case, we're um, selecting the objects to put in these tiles, so we're selecting window objects and also rect um, rectangular niches and arch top niches. And we select a number of tiles here to be 24, and you can see that all the required geometry is, is um, instantly generated. So it's a much more efficient method of generating the geometry. And the final process then is simply refining and mapping this geometry to specific survey data. So there's various methods for um, editing these objects in groups, or else individually for very fast, fast um, refinement. So you can just see here, as you edit, you can edit all objects simultaneously, or you can go into an individual <coughs> object to more precisely map it to survey data. And this can also be done in 2D or 3D um, to allow for more flexibility. So you can see here, just in example, some more components. The, uh, also, the, uh, the, the columns, the shafts of the columns have been automatically generated from cut sections. So again, it's representing the true condition. So it's, if, they're, if they're leaning in a certain way, um, that'll be picked up. Um, this video is just showing side by side a comparison of the semi-automatic method versus the manual method. So if I speed it on there, um, you can see with the semi-automatic method on the left, um, a, a model was generated from the cut sections and the objects would automatically generate in less than two minutes. Whereas on the right, you can see you have to manually position and place every single object. And if you look at the accuracy of both, um, this is just um, using cloud compare software to assess the differences between the point cloud and the bin. You can see straight away on the, on the right in the manual um, method, because the wall had to be modeled as perfectly vertical walls, there's going to be a lot more deformation. So the accuracy was actually improved with the new procedural modeling method. For this particular example, there's a 76% um, it was 76% faster with the new approach, and it was, it was a 27% improvement in accuracy. Um, this accuracy was even um, improved on further, because in the video, just for the purpose of the video, all objects were edited as a group. So by spending a bit more time to just edit some more objects, you can see the accuracy of the wall was brought down to 6 millimeters. And for various other objects, like the beam, 4 millimeters, 3 millimeters for the columns. So it's new tools to model um, objects as they actually exist, and not just as they were designed. Um, and you can analyze these, um, the BIM model and the point cloud um, visually as well. So you can see here the blue represents the, uh, the generated BIM model, whereas the orange represents the point cloud. So you can see how well the, uh, this is a section through one of the windows, how well the BIM uh, matches the profile of the point cloud. And here another section through one of the, the uh, arch niches, and again through, through one of the columns. So it's just a good way of visually comparing both the point cloud and the BIM. And here are just some of the results. We've also been looking at experimenting with uh, mesh models and photo modeling. So again, for the capital there, you can see it represents the true condition of the capital. So if, it's, for some of these capitals, some of the leaves have been damaged, they've fallen off. So by using a mesh model, it's, it's, uh, it takes this into account. And some of the documentation in the results, um, just to conclude, um, you can assess exactly where the, where the wall is leaning from this documentation. You can assess, you can assess some plan or in sections, you can see where columns, if they're not perfectly vertical, you can see this in the plan here. And this is just an example of some more documentation produced from, from this procedural model. So to sum up, um, the benefits of the new HBM and procedural modeling, H procedural modeling approaches include uh, specific tools for, uh, for existing and historic buildings, tools for modeling deformation, and um, there's also increased levels of automation, easier modeling workflows, and all of this will result in um, reduced costs for standard in projects. So I'd like to conclude, and I'd like to just thank, thank some of the uh, some supporters of this project, including the OPW SIS for renting and for um, equipment um, training, and also uh, the DIT and the Irish Research Council for also funding this research. So thank you very much. Thank you,
both especially the perseverance with the technical issues you've very well. Um, we are running a little bit late, but uh, we've still got time for uh, a couple of questions. Hey, Clark. Hi, Clark. Hi, Well done. Uh, very impressive work and so on. And just one quick question. When you're agreeing the parametric models, do you code in any metadata to the actual elements, like in terms of materials? Or, you know? Only if it's required. You know, it's, it's, it's not a problem. Uh, you have to add whatever. It, it could be historic data, or it could be the ability then for the account itself, the schedule itself, you know, the, or energy modeling, etc. That's not a problem. Um, you know, so yeah, we, we, we would have done that. But, um, it's very easy, and it can be added to again in the future, you know, so it's a case of putting in more parameters and, and defining it in the script, but it can easily be done. Yeah. yeah. It's an absolutely wonderful project, um, so congratulations. The defamation process that you do, do you see an application of that to uh, existing systems, in particular pipe work, where the graphic, you know, the graphic nature is a problem? Uh, any of that? Yeah, I think certainly a similar concepts could be developed for other applications like piping. At the moment, for this, um, for this, this research, the focus has been on historical buildings. So this example is designed you know, for this kind of architecture in mind. But certainly, I think it could be developed and it could be tweaked for other applications like that. Okay, I actually missed miss the work part of your discussion. But uh, can you just tell me why do you actually choose Archicad? Yeah, one of the main reasons for choosing Arch Archicad was because they provide an open access to a, to a scripting language called the Geometric Description Language, and by providing that, it allows researchers and other people to easily access, you know, and develop um, new kind of extensions for the software. So, um, did so, you actually compare it to other software, or did you? Yeah, just we're, we're slides. We had two students building the top of the dome and drone, one in Revit, one in Archicad, and then we had IFC both directions. Um, yeah, grand, but you know the problem outside of you know once you once you have access to sort of building formed objects etc. using GDL, um, you don't have that. You know you have to get into the into Python or a lot of you know a lot of the other products still would be closed. Whereas our Okay. Um, once again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.